We are ready for the next segment. Our next keynote is actually a conversation between two very distinguished women. One just completed a term on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, where she represented the Sunset District. And during her time on the board, she championed city businesses and housing for middle-income households, also support for mothers and families in the workplace. And she'll be bringing her experience in land use law to the law firm of Ferella, Braun, and Martell starting next month. Please welcome Katie Tang. <laughs> Okie doke. So Katie will be in conversation with the founder of Stitch Fix. Many of you in this room might be familiar with the company. I know I am. So she started the company in 2011. In 2017, she was the youngest woman to take a company public. She was 34. Uh, prior to founding Stitch Fix, she managed, managed the blogger platform at Polyvore, and she's also served as an associate at the Parthenon Group, and Leader Ventures. In 2015, she joined the board of directors at Grubhub. And in 2018, she joined the board of directors for beauty brand Glossé. And she holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Stanford, an MBA from Harvard. Forgive me, there's a lot. Ahem. She was named to the Forbes Wealthiest Self-Made Women list in 2016, Fast Company's Most Creative People in Business list, Fortune's 40 Under 40 list in 2016, 2017, 2018, Vanity Fair's New Establishment list in 2017, Marie Claire's New Guard list in 2017, and Katrina has been featured on Bloomberg West, CNBC, Good Morning America, NPR, The New York Times, The Today Show, <gasps> and she's a regular panelist at Makers, Vanity Fairs, Founders Fair, and other leading events. Wow. Let's hear from her. Please join me in welcoming Katrina Lake. Good morning, everyone. I love the opening songs for all of us. <laughs> well, I'm so excited to be here with my friend Katrina. Uh, so fun fact, uh, we actually both grew up here in the west side of San Francisco, uh, products of our public schools here. Yes. <laughs> so back at Hoover Middle School, if they had told you that 20-something years later, we'd be sitting here together on stage talking about how you, in 2017, became the youngest female CEO and founder to take a company public, would you have believed and it? And that you would have been the youngest <laughs> supervisor. <laughs> and retired at age 35. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so it's definitely one of those pinch me moments. Um, but uh, for those of you who uh, may not be as familiar with Stitch Fix, I was wondering if Katrina, you could first uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your amazing company. Thank you. Um, and thanks for having me. And my caveat is that I'm technically out on maternity leave right now with my second son. So I'm like a little rusty on the public speaking. <laughs> so forgive me. Um, with Stitch Fix, so Stitch Fix is a company that I founded in 2011. Um, and what we are really trying to do is to kind of de democratize the idea of personal styling. Um, and so we are a completely online-based service. Our clients fill out a profile online, letting us know what they like, what they don't like, what they're looking for. Um, and then we will have a stylist who, our stylists are in hubs all across the country, and we will have a stylist who will then get to know the client, understand her profile, her, his or her profile. Actually, we have men's and kids as well. Um, and to send five things in the mail, um, which you can then try on in the comfort of your home. Um, so this is really borrowed from a concept that is in a lot of higher end department stores historically where there would be a salesperson who would know you, who would proactively ship you things to your home um, so that you could try things on and send things back and do it in a really easy, seamless way. And something that's really enabled now by um, what we can do with e-commerce, what we can do with, um, with data science to help make this more efficient for our stylists. Um, and so now we style over almost three million clients all across the country. Um, and um, employ thousands of people, many of whom are here in San Francisco. That's amazing. And, and you started all of this in your apartment in Cambridge when you were at Harvard Business School. 
That's right. So, and now look where you are at. We're all slackers. We didn't start our own company by age 34. Um, so you could have chosen to uh, locate Stitch Fix anywhere. Um, I know San Francisco is a special place in your heart, of course, having spent your childhood here. Uh, but you know, we're, we're pretty notorious for being very difficult to start your own business here in the city. Uh, which you know we're we're trying to change that climate here, but um, you know why San Francisco and uh, you know what sort of lessons have you learned from starting your company here? Yeah, so um, you know the I guess the the there's a polished answer and kind of an unpolished answer, and the unpolished answer was honestly that like I actually was at first going to start the company in New York, so our first lawyer was in New York. I had I just assumed I was like this is a retail mm -hmm. company, a lot of the brands are in New York. Um, I should probably be in New York, and I think I got a lawyer in New York. I like walked around and looked at some buildings that we, were potential offices, and then um, and then I actually realized that like there was really no reason I had to be there. Like the you could always fly to New York to see the brands. Like there are also brands in LA, um, and the more important thing is that the technology talent. Um, really is here. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, the retail talent was going to be easier to move people here. Or there's also Nike, there's Gap, there's um, there's Gymboree. There are a bunch of companies that were here. Um, and so retail talent seemed easy to access here. And then the talent around um, especially data science, which was kind of at the time a little bit of an early field, like a lot of that was concentrated here. Um, and Stitch Fix of this, the service of Stitch Fix of being able to do personal styling at a price point that's sometimes a $20 garment and sometimes a $40, $50 garment, that was never possible before because it, it just didn't, the math didn't work to pay somebody a living wage to send somebody an $18 tank top. Like that math didn't work. And now using data science, using algorithms, we can make it more efficient. The, the stylist mm -hmm. has to, the stylist can do that job a little faster mm -hmm. and that math works. And that data science element is super important. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the more polished, the, the real, the honest answer was I realized, like, it doesn't have to be in New York, and I'm so much more comfortable here. And mm -hmm. I would love to get to, I would love to be in San Francisco. I would love to build a company here. I would love to, you know, be proud to employ many people in San Francisco. And so for all of those reasons, I chose to be here. Um, but the reality was, looking back, it, it would not have been possible to, to get to where we were without the access to talent. Um, and the access to leadership that we have here. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, one more thing of just like the culture of, I think, people here, which is pervasive across like people in, people in their 20s, I mean, people of all ages in San Francisco that I think is amazing is because we've had so much exposure to Silicon Valley and so much exposure to entrepreneurship, I think there's like a, a frame of mind of people that's like anything is possible and that they believe like when they meet with you when I was an entrepreneur that had nothing and trying to convince people to join me in this crazy venture like I met people in New York too I was like trying to recruit, recruit people from New York trying to recruit people here and um, and there was just there was a lot more skepticism and a lot more I don't think this is gonna work that I heard mm -hmm. in New York and I mean I had um, a guy who was a, um, I'm like, I don't want to specifically talk about who he was, but he was like on the boards of a bunch of retail companies, and he was somebody that I wanted to have as an advisor, and someone who, um, and he knew retail, he'd been in retail his whole life, and he was on the board of a couple companies, and um, and he, he told me as a favor, he was like, look, like, I've been in this business for a long time, and I'm just telling you, like, this is an inventory nightmare, like, yeah. this is not going to work. And well, look at you now. <laughs> and I don't mean that as an I told you so. I just mean it in terms of just like I think the lens of possibility of people here in California and San Francisco in particular is so much wider. Mm -hmm. And that people, you know, they look at people that have crazy ideas and think like, wow, like that's such a cool, crazy idea. And they don't think like, oh, what a crazy idea, which I think is like <laughs> a little bit of the sentiment that I got in New York. Yeah. Um, and so um, and so I think that, you know, that also really helps because I think there are people that love love being part of a crazy vision and love being mm -hmm. part of something that is told isn't going to work and that there's something motivating about that here and something there's a greater aptitude for risk, I think, than yeah. there is in other parts of the country that is just kind of a cultural thing that's hard to replicate. Yeah, and I think what you have done is, I mean, really unique. I mean, it's fashion, it's tech, there's a lot of, uh, like, as you mentioned, data science behind your work. Um, you know, we keep hearing about sort of retail and its death at least in its traditional sense, and what you've done through Stitch Fix, um, really changing the way that business, I think, responds to the needs and desires of customers. And so, um, 
you know, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that and what you've done at Stitch Fix um, that could be applicable across all kinds of different companies, you know, not just for fashion, but, you know, what do we need to do about retail here? Um, it's not just San Francisco, it's really a, a nationwide problem. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's just like an amazing world that we live in now where like my mom, who's an immigrant from Japan, who's like in her 60s, is like calling Ubers and like <laughs> <laughs> and shopping online and um, and FaceTiming me and like I mean it's just this amazing the the change of how we interact with each other and what we're willing to do and how we're willing to do things differently has like the change has happened so quickly in the last ten or fifteen years and um, and it's not just retail I think it's all kinds of businesses like figuring out like well what is what is my customer how does how is their life different now and like how does he or she interact with others now and what does that mean in terms of my business and like how I used to work with that person and so I think with Stitch Fix like I mean I think of it as just this like core customer centricity where mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of retail that felt like um, like a push where it was like um, you know I'm gonna tell you everything that is cool this year mm -hmm. and I'm going to put it all in a store which like you can have the privilege of coming to and um, and then we'll show you what you want. And mm -hmm. I think the reality was that you know we're in a we're in a life today where like that's not what consumers are looking for. Like consumers right. first want individuality. They want to be treated like unique individuals. And also like you know clothing really is about like making you feel great, mm -hmm. making you feel like your best. And that's going to be different for different people. And so I think with Stitch Fix we could kind of like reverse engineer like well what are we actually what's the problem we're really trying to solve here? And like we want to help um, we want to help people look and feel their best. Mm -hmm. And that's going to mean different things to different people. And so I think this idea of just like a storefront that's like, this is what's cool, like th these are the skinny models that are wearing it, and ta-da, like that just like doesn't resonate mm -hmm. and work in today's world. Um, and so, you know, I think it's like trying to figure out like what are those insights of like how has the world changed, how has your customer changed, and then how can you really be where your customer is and really mm -hmm. serve your customer in the way that he or she wants to be served. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, we were in a lot of ways like it's, easier to start from scratch. Like mm -hmm. I think the hard part about retail is that a lot of retailers have these very large aging store bases mm -hmm. and it's really hard to, you know, the physicality of that I think is really hard to get away from. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't envy kind of being in that position and I think we were lucky that we could kind of start from scratch in that way. Um, but, you know, I think we also have to recognize that the world is changing quickly and mm -hmm. is continuing to evolve and, um, and, you know, making sure that we're continuing to keep up in that way. And like a mobile app is a great example of that. Like when Stitch Fix first started, I mean in 2011, which doesn't feel like that long ago, mm -hmm. Um, fashion bloggers were a huge thing and there was a big source for us. Like today, there's still, there are still fashion influencers. Most of them are Insta on Instagram. Most of them are on other, other platforms. And so even in our world, like, you know, something that was core to kind of how we started less than 10 years ago has already evolved and mm -hmm. changed. And so, um, you know, I think it's just, it, it, the lesson is really more around like, how can you make sure that you're keeping up with, um, you know, the change, not like necessarily in technology, the change in just like how your customers are behaving and what your expectations of your, what the expectations of your customers mm -hmm. are. And one thing I uh, was reading about, and, and you mentioned reverse engineering, was I, I really like how you're actually developing your own kind of clothing line based on what, you know, feedback you're getting from customers and what they want. So I, yeah. I really like that. That's been a fun application. So there was a, a reporter who wrote something that I thought spoke really true. It was very, very simple, but just, again, rings very true for me. Katrina has not only changed the way that many of us shop for clothes, but she's also changing how we think about leaders. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And um, one thing I want to talk about with you is workplace culture. Um, something that, uh, an issue that I think we both care a lot about is, uh, you know, workplace, especially uh, the environment for new moms returning to work. Now, you are on not just your first, but your second mm -hmm. maternity leave, and you really made it a point to take 16 whole weeks um, off uh, to be there with your family. And so, kind of, what have you learned from that experience, and why did you feel it was so important to do that? Yeah, um, this whole topic has been so important to me, and I think when I, like, when I was growing up, when I was at Hoover, like, I, when you asked me what did I want to be when I grew up, like, I didn't know I wanted to be an entrepreneur. It wasn't something that felt kind of, um, obvious or accessible or like a path for me. 
And even when I went to business school and I had an inkling that I wanted to be, um, you know, I wanted to be potentially an entrepreneur, I wanted to start a company, like I, I made a spreadsheet of like what are all the, who are all the role models out there that could be like me so that I could mention them in this essay, <laughs> really <laughs> was kind of part of it, but it was, it was kind of sad. Like, you know, there were definitely, a, there were a handful, a true, just a handful of Fortune 500 women who mostly had actually come up the ranks, not through entrepreneurship, um, who were running large companies. But with the exception of that, it was it was really hard. Like you know, never mind like you know, naturally having people in the media to look up to. Like I was scouring kind of the business archives to try to find people that I could say were kind of my role models and people and you know people that I wanted to be like. And I I couldn't find people who looked like me. And so um, it really does mean a lot to me that, and especially I think now as a parent and really recognizing like how how you shape what kids think is possible. Like it is so important to me to um, be able to provide an example of what a different type of leadership looks like and then also to be able to provide that through my actions, through my team. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, so I think with something like maternity leave, like it, I think that even the, I th even the sentiment on that has changed, even in the time that I've been at Stitch Fix, I feel like. Like mm -hmm. I think it too, it, even in 2011, I felt like it was a little bit like, I think that was a little bit, that was potentially around the time of Marissa Mayer where like she had kids and like it was like, I'm, don't worry, I'm gonna be back at work and I'll be back mm -hmm. at work in two weeks. And I mean, there are mixed reactions to that, but like people thought, you know, I think people in some ways like admired that in some ways. And now I feel like it would, it would really be shunned, I think. And so I think mm -hmm. even in a short period of time, I think the sentiment on this has changed a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, I think it's just so, so important to be able to show examples that like you can live this a great full life, but you can prioritize your family, and you can um, and you can achieve these great things, and to be able to show examples of that, um, and you know, I think being able to um, spend time with your you know, with your kids during mm -hmm. that really critical time for women and for men is super important. Mm -hmm. um, like paternity, paternity leave is something that I've really, now that um, I'm seeing kind of friends in New York have kids where their husbands are for the most part expected to be back at work like the next day, two weeks later at the most. Um, it's amazing the permanent negative impact it has on the roles of women and men in those relationships. And so if your husband is back at work two days after the baby's born, your husband is not changing diapers, he is not, he is not comfortable putting the baby down to sleep, he is not using, figuring out how to use the bottle, washing bottles. And here in California, like so many of my friends, they like stack their leaves. So the woman takes 16 weeks, the husband might take his first four, and then he might take his two by himself at the end and be a solo parent for two weeks. And that makes like this amazing positive impact in terms of the confidence of men being able to be like, yeah, I could do this. Like, and I'm gonna stick to this nap time routine. And like, and then yeah. he's and he's so <laughs> much more comfortable in those ways. Mm -hmm. And in New York, it's just so sad because it's this permanent thing that happens where all of a sudden the mom is always doing all the mom stuff mm -hmm. and the husband is not comfortable. And yeah. so, you know, I think it, through I, I always knew it was important, and then now through my own experiences, I really understand just like how important it is, um, not just for the people today, but really role modeling for the future. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, being able to have um, kids grow up in households where you see more shared mm -hmm. responsibilities, and you see, um, you know, you see more like. I don't know, like my son is used to my, you know, his dad changing his diaper in the mornings and every morning he does, right? And the key so is parental leave, right? It's parental not mar exactly. maternity leave, it should be parental and leave. And yeah, it's just, <laughs> I mean, we call it primary and secondary <laughs> leave, but they're both so important. Absolutely. So I wish we could chat so much more. There's so much more to say with Katrina. Uh, we did do a, a wonderful press conference with Stitch Fix uh, last year around lactation policies, because you actually uh, proactively um, had a really great uh, setup for all of your employees. I know you employ a lot of women, uh, which is great. I think what was it, over 60 uh, yes. percent over wom uh, women in your workplace. Um, but uh, you know, there's still a long way to go. I think on the state level and nationwide on this topic. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, Governor Brown vetoed the state legislation that my colleague, um, former colleague Senator Weiner, had introduced around lactation policies in the workplace. Uh, but he'll try again, and hopefully, our new governor will will take leadership on that. 
But um, I just want to thank you, Katrina, and uh, see if you had any kind of last uh, remarks that you wanted to share with our audience today. I know. Thank you. I mean, thank you so much for having me. And, um, you know, I feel so lucky to get to call this city my home. And, um, and I'm so grateful for all that um, the chamber is doing and that all the business leaders in this room are doing to continue to make this a, a great place to live and a great place to, um, to have a company. So I'm just very grateful. All right. Thanks, Katrina. <laughs>